Welcome back, everyone, to Guilty Minds, a virtual conference on mens rea and criminal justice reform. My name is Michael Serretta. I'm a visiting assistant professor at ASU Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. So I'm going to be moderating the next panel, which is titled Malice, Intoxication, and Mental Illness, Theory, Doctrine, and Reform. In this panel, we're going to be focusing on two excellent papers, The Depths of Malice by Vera Berkelson and Internal and External Challenges of Culpability by Stephen Morse. Vera Bergelson is a distinguished professor of law and Robert E. Knowlton scholar at Rutgers Law School. Stephen Morris is the Ferdinand Wakeman Hubble Professor of Law, a professor of psychology and law and psychiatry, and the associate director for the Center for Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. Joining us for the discussion are two other outstanding scholars. The first is Judge Nancy Gertner, who is a senior lecturer on law at Harvard Law School and a retired United States District Judge. The second is Professor Kimberly Frizan, who is the Earl Hepburn Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. Welcome everyone. I'm honored to moderate this panel with all of you. So I wanna get things started with an overview of these two papers. In brief, Vera's paper argues that the common law mental state of malice is important as a matter of policy and that its abandonment by the model penal code affects the fairness and coherence of modern criminal law. Stevens' paper argues that recent legal scientific trends threaten respect for mens rea and moral responsibility. So in making these arguments, each paper raises enough issues to fill a day's worth of discussion. So in these remarks, I'm gonna focus on the thread that I think unites them. Read together, I think they provide a call not just for mens rea reform, but a vision of the kind of shared moral principles that ought to animate it. Thinking in terms of intuitive notions of justice instead of ethically suspect ideas about dangerousness, provides the basis for a more proportionate and ultimately less punitive criminal justice system. Or at least that's a story I think these papers share. Vera and Steven should please feel free to correct me if I get it wrong. Okay, so most conversations about mens rea policy revolve around the model penal code. And that's for good reason. Because as Vera highlights, the MPC significantly clarified the common law of mens rea by replacing dozens of vague terms with four clearly defined mental states. Those are purpose, knowledge, recklessness, and negligence. The code also offers default rules that strive to ensure some mental state applies to every element of an offense. So these legislative proposals won the MPC praise from academics, and they've also been extremely influential. As Vera notes, they've been explicitly adopted in more than half of American jurisdictions while they guide judicial interpretations of mens rea and many others. But as academics also know, it's easy to overstate the MP's influence or the strength of mens rea protections in America, because one important goal of the MPC was to limit the use of strict liability in the criminal law. And on this critical point, the MPC's influence has been surprisingly limited. So the previous panels have highlighted a number of ways that state legislatures have disregarded the MPC's narrow mens rea recommendations. Stevens paper expands our understanding even further by highlighting what he refers to as the internal challenge to culpability, which relates to mens rea in the broad sense. So this challenge is reflected in the many ways that courts and legislatures ignore mental disorder in making decisions about liability and punishment. What results is a system where someone who either lacks the mental state required by an offense or the ability to think or act morally due to severe mental illness can end up being seriously punished. That's in contrast to say, civilly committing that person to get them mental health treatment while at the same time keeping the community safe. These disconcerting legal trends conflict with the MPC's recommendations, but they appear to be constitutional based on some dubious decisions from the US Supreme Court a point Stephen does a great job of highlighting. Even more important though, these trends conflict with the retributively based understanding of culpability that lies at the heart of our shared morality. So this shared morality is central to both papers. So I'm gonna, it's worth saying a bit about it. To oversimplify, I think we can say that it rests on three basic premises. The first is that our mental states, things like intentions, beliefs, and desires, matter in a causal sense, which is to say, our mental states play a significant role in explaining why we do the things we do. The second premise is that humans have the capacity to act for reasons and to reason about the best course of action. This creates the possibility 
that the decisions we make express attitudes and value judgments about who and what we care about. The third premise is that these empirical facts have intuitive moral significance. For example, if we have the ability to deliberate and make choices, then it's reasonable for others to have expectations of us. Things like don't impose unnecessary risks to the safety and well-being of others. And when the choices we make fail to live up to those moral obligations, well, then we deserve to be blamed, if not punished. But our shared morality also recognizes that not all bad choices are the same. So it's important that punishment reflect these key differences in blameworthiness. This kind of proportionality is essential to ensuring that punishment is deserved. And as Vera points out, it's also necessary if the law is to reflect public conceptions of justice. Arguably, this connection is what affords the criminal law its moral authority and perceived legitimacy, which is a key component of public safety, as scholars like Tracy Mears and Paul Robinson teach us. So we should be concerned that this connection between our shared morality and mens rea is often absent. And that's not in spite of the NBC, but in a number of situations because of it. That's because the code's policy recommendations aren't really rude in our shared morality. Instead, they're based on utilitarian notion of controlling dangerous people that in many ways is anathema to our shared reality. This clash of principles plays a central role in both papers. So I'm gonna say more about it in a minute, but first it's worth considering a couple of illustrations. So one comes from Stephen's paper, which discusses the MPC's imputation approach to voluntary intoxication. That approach equates the culpability of becoming drunk with the conscious awareness of anything a criminal might do while drunk. So this makes it possible for a person whose only moral failing is to have intentionally gotten extremely intoxicated at home to be convicted of any crime of recklessness that occurs afterward, so long as the person would have been aware of the risk had they been sober. And that's true even if the person lacked the subjective awareness required by the offense, say because he or she was in a drug-induced state of unconsciousness and then engaged in wrongdoing afterward. Here we see the same kind of unjust in for a penny, in for a pound approach to punishment mentioned in yesterday's panels. That approach supports treating someone who negligently gets intoxicated just as severely as someone who commits to pray for murder. And that's a serious problem because getting extremely drunk at home violates one kind of societal expectation, whereas consciously disregarding an extreme risk of death to another human being violates an entirely different one. So it's a grave injustice, as Stephen powerfully argues, to fail to recognize these differences in culpability. And that's just one example, because Vera's paper highlights an even broader and more universal conflict between modern criminal codes and our shared morality. That conflict revolves around the role that partially justifying reasons and other imperfect defenses play in ensuring proportionate punishment. To illustrate, let me give you two different homicidal actors. The first kills a terminally ill old man suffering in a hospital bed out of sheer hatred and sadism. He's never met the victim before and could care less about him. He just finds random acts of violence thrilling. The second is the old man's son, who after careful deliberation, decides to kill his father out of compassion with the hopes of ending his father's horrific suffering. Both of these killings are purposeful, sure, but we intuitively perceive a big difference in blameworthiness between the two. One acts to satisfy a perverse pleasure, while the other is driven by mercy. These are very different moral attitudes, so each deserves distinct criminal sanctions. But the MPC fails to deliver. It largely rejects the relevance of this kind of moral distinction, at least at the liability stage. That's because the drafters decided to replace morally charged common law mental states like malice with the more cognitively focused PKRN framework. Again, that's purpose, knowledge, recklessness, and negligence. Typically, this move is celebrated by scholars. Not so fast, Fair argues, because the mental state of malice captured something significant that PKRN doesn't. The moral relevance of what she describes is a free, unobstructed choice to do evil. You see, to prove the malicious state of mind necessary for murder conviction, the government has to establish the complete absence of excuse or justification. So someone like the mercy killing son who is motivated by good if imperfect reasons could have his charge lowered to manslaughter, whereas a sadistic killer couldn't. So moral philosophy, psychological studies, and common sense recognize the importance of this kind of mitigation. 
in which case the drafter's decision to omit the malice inquiry from the modern law of homicide may have lost something important. And that's true, Vera seems to believe, even though the code does recognize mitigation for intentional homicides influenced by extreme mental or emotional disturbances. But the greatest implication of Vera's argument are for outside the homicide context. Here, the conventional accounting says that all partial defenses, from partial justifications to partial excuses, are ignored entirely by criminal codes. But are they really? Because Vera's paper identifies a fascinating legal trend which people rarely appreciate. There's actually precedent for applying these partial defenses to non-homicide crimes through the use of the malice mental state. To illustrate, Vera discusses a case out of the District of Columbia involving a woman who, in the heat of passion, smashed the front windows and door of her mom's house, believing that her mom had taken custody of her runaway child. The moral significance of the defendant's understandable loss of self-control arising from that serious, serious provocation is clear. Yet modern criminal codes would ignore it because the defendant was not charged with homicide. But that turns out not to be in the case into the district whose ancient criminal code applies the mental state of malice to destruction of property, which raises a paradox. One of the worst codes in the country arguably reaches a more intuitively just result than the MPC would through its expanded use of a common law mental state. So should we throw out the MPC and dust off those old codes? Not as I understand Vera's argument, but perhaps we should pause to consider what the MPC drafters were trying to achieve with their mens rea provisions. Because the drafters had a particular ideology, and it's one that arguably conflicts with our shared morality. All too often, the code privileges empiricism over value judgments, efficiency over moral depth, and dangerousness over desert. This is what led the code drafters to develop descriptive, cognitively focused mental states that can ignore the kinds of ends-based evaluations which our shared morality presupposes. Not only does this view of punishment provide a weak foundation for culpability requirements, but in some ways it's actually hostile to it. In fact, one could argue that these ideas about controlling dangerous people, if taken to their logical conclusion, might lead one to reject our shared morality altogether. That's the idea behind the final part of Stephen's paper, which discusses the external challenge to culpability allegedly posed by the new behavioral neuroscience and genetics. Stephen's arguments against this challenge are rich with nuanced ideas, so I'm not gonna be able to fully do them justice. But here's a short version. Recent scientific findings about the brain don't mean what a vocal group of moral responsibility skeptics claim they do. Empirical advancements in our understanding of the mind remain consistent with foundational moral concepts like agency and choice that our shared morality rests on. And a deterministic view of human behavior is entirely compatible with central criminal law concepts like culpability and deserved punishment. Stephen navigates the relationship between science and morality with impressive clarity, but his writing shines the brightest when explaining what there is to lose in abandoning these concepts. Building on the work of P.F. Strawson and Sir James Stephen, he argues that the radical challenge to moral responsibility would leave us with a vision of the person, of interpersonal relations, and of society that bleaches the soul. In the concrete and practical world we live in, Stephen argues, we must be guided by our values and a vision of good life. And aligning the criminal law's culpability judgments with our shared morality is an important part of that. So where do these excellent papers leave us in terms of the big picture? What I think we find is not only an argument for mens rea reform, but a vision of the kinds of moral principles that ought to animate it. By aligning the law of culpability with our shared notions of blameworthiness and moral responsibility, we should be able to secure more justice and maybe even more public safety in the long run. Contrary to popular misconception, retributive thinking can indeed provide the basis for individualized leniency. But achieving that goal is gonna require policymakers to look beyond the MPC, not only at the level of doctrine, but also worldview. Lawmakers need to appreciate the wisdom of the evaluative mens rea policies of the past. And they should be appropriately cautious about what science is able to tell us about our shared morality, both today and perhaps also in the years to come. At the very least, a criminal justice system entirely divorced from culpability and moral responsibility may turn out to be more unsettling than we think. So that's a narrative that I think arises from these papers, and it's one that I myself find strongly appealing. But I should also admit that I tend to find myself agreeing with most of what Vera and Stephen write, and I want to take my role as moderator seriously, so I'm going to briefly raise some questions. So 
I think the picture of mens rea under the MPC may be a bit more complicated than Vera's paper lets on. Is it really the case that the code treats mens rea as a purely cognitive matter, devoid of emotional or moral content? Consider the gross deviation prong in the MPC definitions of recklessness and negligence, which asks fact finders to make a culpability judgment in terms of whether the defendant's disregard of the risk justifies moral condemnation. Or compare the common law heat of passion standard with the MPC's expanded approach, which accounts for extreme grief and ignores suspect moral values with the hopes of strengthening the normative message of mitigation for manslaughter. One could argue that there's even greater recognition of emotional and moral considerations on the MPC's innovations, though I don't think that detracts from Vera's big picture analysis. I also finished Vera's paper hoping to hear a bit more about the legislative solution. Because from a co-drafting perspective, it's not as simple as just creating a malice general provision, an idea that her paper proposes in passing. Because the use of a malice mental state depends upon the existence of a manslaughter type offense. So unless you expect the absence of malice to provide the basis for a complete exoneration in all non-homicide cases, then implementing a general malice framework would seem to require creating a voluntary manslaughter type offense for every category of crimes. So that's a lot of work and complexity to add to criminal codes. Perhaps a better solution would be to ignore malice, but to instead provide a generic doctrinal mitigating excuse of partial responsibility that would apply to all crimes. Both Stephen and Paul Robinson have recommended this type of proposal, which I think could effectively capture the value of malice without needing to add another mental state to the hierarchy. Stephen, your paper offers a strong case, I think, against the unsubstantiated scientific claim that responsibility and desert don't exist. But I think someone more sympathetic to the incompatibilist position might try to argue that there's an equally bold moral claim which underlies your paper, that the legal system has the ability to accurately identify responsibility and desert in any deep sense. So for example, this interlocutor might argue that twin studies, research on early childhood development, and common sense all indicate that genes and environment play a big role in crime. That is, some people have strong urges to commit crimes, others don't. Some have been socialized towards criminality, others haven't. Of course, not everyone who has strong criminal urges or grows up in bad environments commits a crime, so space still remains for more responsibility. But given the undeniable influence of factors beyond a person's control, just how realistic is it to think that we or courts have the ability to accurately gauge the blameworthiness of a choice, or just how much punishment is truly deserved under the circumstances? And isn't that necessary to ensuring proportionate punishment? Anyways, these are just a couple of questions one might raise in response to these excellent papers. And both Steve and Vera, neither of you need to answer them here. But at this point, I just want to turn it over to you guys to, to share your thoughts. Professor Bergelson, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for putting together this wonderful conference and for uh, your remarks. Uh, they are incredibly generous. And I think that your presentation of my paper is definitely much better than my own. Uh, <laughs> as for the two points that you raised, uh, one was uh, about whether I was probably a little bit too, um, put it too strong judgment concerning the model penal code, uh, saying that it is devoid of um, moral and emotional uh, component. Uh, maybe I did carry carried away a little bit, but generally, I would defend this view saying that, well, you raised uh, examples of negligence and recklessness, but recklessness is just conscious disregard of substantial unjustifiable risk. And uh, as I wrote in my paper, it's probably some uh, trace of the doctrine of malice because uh, in many uh, uh, codes, malice is understood as the absence of this justifiability. So, yes, we see something resembling that. And we know that the drafters tried not to move too much from the existing codes. Uh, same thing about negligence, maybe less because negligence is the standard of a reasonable person. It's an objective standard. So really, we cannot talk about uh, the moral the morality of the actor. We can only talk about the morality of society as such. As for extreme um, mental or emotional disturbance, uh, again, it's clearly one trace of malice, the doctrine that used to unify uh, all defenses and partial defenses, and that's how it made sense. But now they're all just 
uh, distinct uh, features, not as persuasive as they were intended to be. And even with that extreme mental and emotional disturbance, it really looks uh, not at the moral side of the uh, issue, but rather how uh, much the defendant was out of control. It's purely excusatory uh, rationale, uh, looking at uh, various factors that all kinds of reasons that could make the defendant uh, not the kind of a rational actor to whom the law addresses its commands. So maybe to some extent uh, I should soften the language, but I still would insist that the MPC uh, chose to draft mens rea in uh, descriptive and cognitive terms and omitted the moral component almost entirely and emotional pretty much so. Uh, as for the second point uh, regarding, uh, so how should we put that in the code? That's a very fair point, right? And um, whether, the, uh, whether the absence of malice can serve as a mitigator. And that's, that's a good proposal, uh, I would like that. The only uh, thing is that we need some kind of doctrinal explanation and we need malice in the code. So for example, uh, take any crime. You will not, uh, the, the MPC would not define it uh, in specifically in terms of say, uh, actus reus, voluntary act, right? It says nothing about that, but we all understand that actus reus, the requirement of voluntary act is essential. It's right there, it's in the MPC, it's uh, overarching. In the same sense, we could put malice as an overarching doctrine in this article too, and then later on understand that just like if there is no voluntary act, there is no crime. If there is no malice, the crime is different. Uh, and just like with the voluntary act, sometimes it's very hard to define precisely what you have in mind, all the instances. So the MPC chose um, an easier way. They just listed an umber, a number of uh, instances that are not voluntary acts. If we have to follow that route with malice, we might have, we, we could follow it. it. It doesn't defeat the whole proposal. But of course, I would prefer a more um, um, holistic definition and approach involving malice. That's great. Yeah. Stephen, do you have anything to add? There you go. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, those were those were really good comments. The wise guy in me wanted to say they were all rubbish, but uh, you know, I just, I just, I just couldn't bring myself to do it in light of how polite everyone else has been. Uh, really fair-minded. Uh, one thing I want to add, and then I want to answer your question specifically. Uh, and again, you you represented very clearly. Uh, the argument I make about external challenges, uh, what you might call the exoneration project or if you're into the neuroscience, we're all just a pack of neurons and stuff like that. This, has, this is not just a straw man. There are well-funded transatlantic uh, projects going on now to try to actually develop what a system would look like. It's moving towards mostly a medical quarantine type notion of social control. Uh, what I would say about that generally is it's impractical as well as a blight on the human spirit. But let me get to uh, Michael's question, uh, which was really a, a two-part question. Uh, one question is, and instead of determinism, let's use physicalism plus a causally closed universe. Because, in other words, there, there are no spooky, uh, no spooky agents out there, no spooky theories about anything. It all starts with matter and the physical laws of the universe. Uh, what happens may be indeterministic, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's random. Something like that. Well, look, whether or not in a universe like that, responsibility is possible is one question at a metaphysical level. And that we're not gonna answer. Uh, people have been trying for 2,500 years and or more, 
And we're not going to get an answer to that metaphysical question for reasons that are well explored in the philosophical literature. But the second part of your question, or the implicit second part, was suppose you are, as I am, a necessary retributivist. I'm a mixy, mix, mushy mixed theorist of punishment. But I believe that uh, retributivism sets both a floor and a cap. I don't believe there's a tablet in the sky, unlike. Michael Moore, who's known to many of you, who believes that in principle there's a right number you can put on what is at least deserved and no more than deserved. I, unlike Michael, don't believe there's that tablet in the sky. You could be a tough or a tender retributivist. But if you're a retributivist and trying to figure out whether people are somewhat less responsible and therefore deserve less blame and punishment, what I do believe is it can't just be because there's a causal story about events out of our control. That would prove too much. None of us would ever be responsible for anything. So in our moral and legal system, we have developed a bunch of excusing conditions or mitigating conditions. Um, I generically like to put them as a lack of rational capacity and a lack of adequate self-regulation or self-control. The latter is more scientifically and conceptually fraught, but lots of people think it ought to be there. Fine, I don't want to argue that. So the only question to me always is, does the causal story, whatever it might be, does it shed light on whether this particular defendant actually had less capacity for rationality or less capacity for self-control? I'll give you an example and conclude. It's my favorite example, which is the famous Dunedin study out of New Zealand, which uh, longitudinally looked at over a thousand youths and followed them right into uh, early, uh, late adolescence and early adulthood, and looked at the rates of antisocial and criminal conduct. And it turns out that if you were the victim as a child of severe abuse, your risk of being a violent criminal or an antisocial person was only slightly increased. If you had a particular enzyme defect that was genetically transmitted, an MAO, which then goes and affects uh, neurotransmitters, you had a slightly increased risk of uh, antisocial conduct, but not much. But if you had the gene by environment interaction, then you were nine times more likely than the controls to be involved in antisocial conduct. And the interesting thing was, among the people who had the gene by environment interaction, only 27% of that group was antisocial. So 73% were not. Okay, how does that story help us? Because we now know it's a risk factor for antisocial conduct. You've had this unfortunate gene by environment combination, which is not up to you, the defendant, in any way whatsoever. Well, this wasn't a clinical study, so I just made up stuff. But yeah, that's what good lawyers do. We make up stuff. And no one does it better than judges, as Judge Herkner knows. So, uh, in any <laughs> case, let's assume that this particular interaction really increases impulsivity among those who have it. Fine, and what we think of, many of us, is impulsivity is a form of rationality defect. You can't keep good reasons present to your mind as well as you should, so you become a steep time discounter. Okay, and then, then the question just generalizes to, should impulsivity be a generalized excusing condition? And if we think yes, then maybe we ought to take into account. That comes to the very final point, which is how much? And since I don't think we now have the tools to measure fine gradations of any of lack of capa uh, rational capacity or lack of control capacity, that's why I have provided for a generic partial responsibility excuse, which I do think overlaps a lot with the thinking of Vera's. Vera, I know, prefers to do it a different way. I prefer to do it my way for matters of simplicity, but it's a sort of one size fits all because that's the best we can do epistemically at present. Maybe we'll get better in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> At this point, I want to give our, uh, our, our respondents the opportunity to jump in. So why don't we start with you, Judge Gardner? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Um, let me start with uh, Vera's paper. Uh, um, uh, I wonder how much of the MPC's 
uh, focus on cognitive capacity rather than moral capacity. The kinds of distinctions that you make of bad motive, good motive, just to generalize too much, that they didn't make in the body of the MPC because the MPC anticipated an indeterminate sentencing regime. In other words, there was an institutional bias to the MPC, which, is, which I find extraordinary when we go back and look at it. The jury was cabined in the way that you describe cognitive focus and not normative focus in the way you described. But judges could make the kinds of distinctions um, that juries would not be permitted to make. And that, for me, having played virtually all roles in the criminal justice system, except defendant and prosecutor. Actually, that's not completely true. But in any event, we can talk about that off camera. Um, uh, the, there's a, the, the institutional question is a, is a critical question. Is this uh, appropriate for a jury to make? I was thinking of Paul Butler wrote a piece in the, Wall Street, in the uh, Washington Post in which he reconfigured the Breonna Taylor case as not involving three cops at the door, but three gangbangers. And whether whatever, whatever the doctrine was, and particularly if malice, if we sort of allow to come into this, the normative considerations that malice allows, that that will invite in the system precisely the kinds of distinctions uh, that he wants to make. In other words, if it was three gangbangers at the door who knocked on the door loudly, there was a gunshot, and then they mowed everyone down with, uh, 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 with, with, with fire, isn't that extraordinarily likely that would be seen as imperfect self-defense that would be creating the danger in ways that the police officers were not. So does malice begin to um, uh, bleed into the system here considerations that we are trying to avoid in other settings? I also, um, and again, this may, be, this may be the judge part of me, which just, you, you, you know, you can't get rid of. Um, when you talk about the expressive function, others have talked about the expressive function of the criminal law and malice is, is the malice that you describe is, is uniquely talking about that expressive function. Um, in a regime in which, in plea bargaining, in a regime in which the jury makes the general verdict and in which all of these considerations are likely to play, wouldn't it be better to have the kinds of concerns your describing in a, in, in a sentencing regime, and not fully indeterminate, but one in which a judge could say, I'm going to make a difference between the guy who intentionally kills the patient because he hates him and the guy who kills the patient in a, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, mercy killing. And then that becomes recognized in an institutional moment when it can be expressed as opposed to implicit. Um, so, um, but I, I, I mean, I love the notion, I love what you were trying to do because it is of course implicit in the system no matter what the MPC did. Um, with respect to Stephen, he's very interesting. I told Michael to call me Judge Gertner, but everybody else I'm gonna call by their first name. That, but um, Professor Morse. Um, We've had, we, we've talked this before, we've been on, on this issue before. I, I love the part of your paper, I love when you talk about the ways in which uh, mental states can bear, can vitiate the mens rea of the MPC and to open up the door to do that. You and I have had lengthy conversations about uh, Mr. Oft, the guy who had the tumor that made him, uh, arguably made him uh, uh, like uh, uh, child pornography and, and be a predator. But as you describe, even he figured out when his wife wasn't home. Even he, uh, so that it was not, it was not eliminating mens rea, it was bore on mens rea. It didn't vitiate it entirely, but it certainly bore on it. So, and then you talk in the second part of your paper about uh, uh, the determinism of uh, the neuroscience. There is an intermediate position here, which I've struggled with as a judge and struggle now within my writing. 
when you talk about addiction or when you talk about the traditional mental states, it's one thing. But when we begin to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, when we begin to talk about toxic stress that comes from having been a victim, a witness, or a perpetrator of crime, when we talk about adverse childhood experiences, uh, neuroscience has not yet enabled us to identify the individual who has that in a way that would reduce mens rea, but it might. And when we begin to talk about that, those kinds of neuroscience categories that are really bound up in society and not just something, in te- you know, something that is intrinsic in the person, will we dissolve criminal law? In other words, I want to deal with the, the determinism issue, not as a big issue, but if I could take into account in the cases of the men before me charged with crack cocaine, the fact that their backgrounds were impairing in fundamental ways. If I could let a jury do that, um, then there's almost an intermediate position between traditional mens rea determinism and allowing societal the impact of society to sort of bleed into this through the brain. Um, so I'll stop there. Wonderful. So, uh, Professor Perzan, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. Do I really have four minutes left to do that? You can start, but we'll pick back up after the break and you keep going. Okay, great. So, um, I, I admire Michael's ability to weave these two papers together. I can't do that. Uh, I'm going to deal with them separately. I am going to start with Stevens. Um, And I have neither an internal nor an external challenge for him, uh, but I want to uh, foreground uh, an important relationship between mens rea and proof that I think is implicit uh, and somewhat explicit in the discussion of the first two cases uh, that he mentions. Uh, And it's really important to see that it doesn't matter how we formulate mens rea rules Uh, It doesn't matter that we require proof beyond a reasonable doubt if at the end of the day we tie the defendant's hands behind his back in how he might negate mens rea. And so let me say something briefly about Clark before I turn to Egelhoff, right? So the idea that you can be convicted of intentionally killing a person when you thought you were killing an alien, right, should frighten all of us. (laughs) If the state seeks to label someone a murderer, If the state claims that to be a murderer, you have to act purposefully or knowingly, if the state has to prove all of its elements beyond a reasonable doubt, then any legitimate evidence that undermines that mental state ought to be allowed. And it strikes me that this is relatively straightforward. I think the trickier case to unravel is Egelhoff. And here I'm going to borrow from my frequent co-author, Larry Alexander. I didn't co-author this with him. Um, But I think he does a really nice job of unpacking exactly what's at stake in that case and what worries us. So when we think about preventing the defendant from introducing evidence of voluntary intoxication, we might think, well, what's the problem here? We prevent defendants from introducing evidence all the time, right? And that was, in fact, what Justice Scalia thought was going on here. It was actually about uh, preventing the introduction of evidence. Justice O'Connor thought there was something going on with the burden of proof. So who was right? Justice O'Connor was right. Uh, If we think about how we typically establish mens rea beyond a reasonable doubt, the prosecution has to rely on inferences. I point a gun at Gideon's head. It seems a reasonable person would intend to kill Gideon if that's what they did. And therefore, voila, we think I intended to kill Gideon. In fact, Gideon Yaffe said as much yesterday, right? He said, look, the state proves the actus reus. They say, hey, the defendant's kind of normal or he is normal, voila, we've got mens rea here. So the question then becomes how it is that we get from a permissive inference that somebody intends the natural and probable consequence of their behavior to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And it turns out that what's really going on here is that the defendant isn't coming forward with any reason to break that inference. The defendant isn't showing us why it is that he isn't the kind of normal guy. 
So what Egelhoff holds is that the defendant can't introduce evidence of voluntary intoxication. And therefore, the defendant's silenced at this incredibly crucial stage where the defendant would otherwise be able to break the inference. So what the prosecution gets is essentially an irrebuttable permissible inference. If per Sandstrom, such an inference is unconstitutional when it's considered a presumption, then it ought to be considered unconstitutional here as well. And I suspect that Stephen won't disagree with this, but I think that it's just crucial for us to foreground the relationship that we have, not just in how we formulate mens rea and that we require uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, but how it is that our evidentiary rules can undercut that. So I think, Michael, I'm exactly at time to stop and then I'll pick You're up- good, and we will open up after a five minute break with, uh, with your remarks on, on Professor Bergelson's paper. All right, see you soon. Hey, welcome back, everyone. We're now about to pick up the second half of the panel on malice, intoxication, and mental disorder. Um, so, okay, uh, Professor Frizan, you were in the middle of giving some feedback. Uh, you, you, you discussed uh, Stephen's paper, and now we're ready to hear your thoughts on Professor Burgosson's. Great. Uh, so, Vera, I am skeptical that malice is the cure to the model penal code's ills. So, First, I am less certain that what you identify as an ill really is one. So you list some views about that the model penal code has at the beginning, some of its doctrines, mainly about the irrelevance of results in a number of crimes, and say that this manifests a utilitarian logic. Uh, but as you know, many card-carrying retributivists, including this speaker, subscribe to all of those views. And therefore, I don't think that you have to be a utilitarian or buy into dangerousness to think that the model penal code's crime definitions are getting something right. I then wonder about whether or not drafting a code in cognitive terms means that we're really ridding the criminal law uh, of its moral valence. Right, so the question, this I think is more about statutory drafting than it is about missing the morality, right? So when you think about teaching Cunningham uh, and how malice gets reduced then to recklessness, uh, you then have to ask, well, does that mean Cunningham didn't have any ill will? Well, if you consciously disregard, you appreciate a risk and you take it anyway, you're manifesting insufficient concern for others. If you purposefully harm someone, you're manifesting insufficient concern for them, right? If you know you're accepting uh, and demonstrating a willingness to cause harm. So it seems as though even if cognitively phrased, uh, these mental states can still have the same moral valence. In fact, I think it's telling that jurisdictions over time have unpacked the term malice into the very cognitive mental states that you uh, dislike, right? Cunningham reduces malice to recklessness. California in Knoller takes abandoned and malignant heart, depraved heart, you know, malice, and that becomes recklessness too. Malice of forethought gets reduced to intention to kill, uh, depraved heart killings, etc. So for all that we throw morally loaded language into our statutory drafting, we unpack this language into the very concepts that you seem to think lack this moral valence. Now, Vera, you may be right that the criminal law is sometimes missing something, but then the question becomes what the best way to go about law reform here is, and whether or not we should just think that malice applying that wholesale is what the solution should be. Right, so if you think about your solutions where you list, or you, the puzzles where you list like seven different cases where an independent, where a bystander is killed, and you tell us what well, hatred and jealousy and to get the fortune, right? And you say, this is somebody who's identified with the evil and aimed at evil. Sure, and those are cases that the common law would have called express malice, but are we then gonna go with implied malice? What about the person who sets fire to the house 
knowing someone's inside, but not caring, right? So when we start using this concept, what do we mean by it? And even when we have it, right, it may just not do the work we think, right? Forest in North Carolina had premeditation and it had malice, right? It's not a model penal code case. It's a case where the North Carolina Supreme Court upheld the first degree murder conviction, even in the face of a statute that allowed for voluntary manslaughter uh, if in fact the jury found that malice was lacking. So if we think that there's a problem here, what we may want to do is, is expand the extreme mental and emotional disturbance, ex, uh, expand diminished responsibility uh, in the way that um, Stephen has suggested, but it doesn't mean that we should go uh, full scale to adopting malice. Uh, so that is, I worry that even if many of the cases, I agree with you, Vera, and I think that defendant's purpose can aggravate or mitigate, uh, that circumstances can matter and so forth. I worry that in contrast to the crisp normative power of consent that you've written so brilliantly about, um, malice is a stand-in for too many ideas, each of which needs independent careful attention. So even if ma malice has been lost in the model penal code translation, we should not be too quick to add it back in. So, so with that, I wanna give both Stephen and Vera an opportunity to respond. Vera, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I will start with Judge Grubner's comments, which uh, I think are very valid and interesting. And I think there are basically two important points here. One, uh, Judge Grubner uh, suggested that perhaps uh, the MPC choice regarding the cognitive mental states was influenced by the indeterminate sentencing regime. And I think there is um, a very interesting um, possibility here, which may be even deeper, because clearly uh, the indeterminate sentencing regime was a function of the uh, theory of rehabilitation, which was predominant at the time of the model penal code drafting. And as we know, the MPC generally, even though Kim may disagree to some extent, but many agree that the MPC is predominantly a utilitarian document, which was concerned with deterrence and rehabilitation. So in that sense, your uh, idea about indeterminate sentencing regime, which is all based on rehabilitation, comes in as a possibility. And uh, it's quite possible that um, at a deeper level, uh, these things are related, that the utilitarian character of the MPC determined to, come, to some extent that uh, mens rea was defined in cognitive terms, and the same fact that it is a utilitarian document determined that uh, the sentencing regime it chose was indeterminate. However, I don't think that the two uh, parts the indeterminate sentencing regime and cognitive mental states are necessarily related directly because I can easily imagine uh, uh, your standard uh, statute of the 50s, which included, or the 40s, which included malice and at the same time uh, used the indeterminate sentencing regime. The two functioned well together, just in the sense that the person who committed malicious crime uh, perhaps required longer rehabilitation and therefore uh, in this indeterminate sentencing regime uh, should stay uh, longer uh, under the supervision of the criminal justice system. Uh, as for the second point, uh, which relates to the um, division of powers basically between the jury and the judge, uh, I certainly can see uh, where you are worried about the jury sort of rephrasing the existing set of events and uh, expressing its own preferences and perhaps biases and uh, not providing a consistent, uh, consistent institutional solution where judges, for instance, could um, provide that solution. Uh, 
I think there is a lot of truth in what you are saying, particularly when we take into account the expressive function about which you spoke, if we want to send a message to the community. And that's why I was talking about uh, the third power, the legislature, which I think is better suited, better than judges and juries, uh, in um, providing guidance of what kind of harm and what kind of uh, uh, wrong we consider particularly serious. So that was um, to Judge uh, Gertner. Thank you. There are very interesting comments. Uh, to Kim, um, part of the debate has been going on since law school. I was absolutely sure when um, Michael told me that you would be one of the commentators that you would raise this point about the uh, wrong retributivists, not just harm retributivists, but wrong retributivists. That, you know, and uh, the, the debate that was, has been going on was about the um, moral significance of harm, which Kim, as we know, uh, basically denies, and uh, I, as we know, um, strongly support. Uh, so uh, when you are saying that uh, the NPC is not necessarily all based on utilitarian values, well, of course not entirely, because the idea of the NPC drafters was to provide um, a model that would be close to the existing law and that the jurisdictions would be willing to adopt. Their main focus was on uh, very rational and um, um, but at the same time, um, sure, some, some elements when we talk about, again, recklessness, and I think Michael raised the same point when he said that recklessness, concept of recklessness, it has already some moral component. I do not disagree with that. I think that it is the remnant of this general um, inquiry into the morality of the conduct. And this general inquiry into the morality is basically malice, even if we cannot define it as crisply as I would like to. But at the same time, if you look, say, at the choice of evils, 302, right, particularly the comments to the choice of evils, where uh, which rejects the uh, rule that still is followed by the entire universe, practically, the, that killing of uh, an innocent, unoffending person uh, is uh, never justified by necessity. So, St Stephen, do you want to go ahead and, and jump in? Okay. I will uh, first respond to uh, Kim. And, um, I would, and of course, can you uh, all hear me? Hold on a second, Michael. Uh, I didn't finish answering Kim. Is it okay? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, my could you? Did you my not? Apology. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, I did not. Yeah. Go ahead. You didn't hear me, or did I run out of time? I. No, no. You're good. You're good. My apologies. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, I will. I will be very brief. Oh, then I will just you know just hit a couple of points and that's it. So I, I was talking about the NPC that is mainly utilitarian. I was raising the issue of the choice of evils, which was numerical and not based on any normative deontological uh, prohibition. Uh, but I will talk briefly about a couple of other uh, points. Uh, right. Uh, the, the most important question that Kim raised was whether it's the best way to reform and uh, what shall we do and how shall we draw lines between this express and implied malice and um, uh, uh, whether in, in fact perhaps a better way is to just have uh, litigators like uh, extreme mental emotional disturbance or diminished capacity that would simply uh, mitigate the, uh, the offenses. And uh, um, I don't think so. I think that there are different ways to go in terms of drafting, and we have, can have various uh, options, including 
possible mitigators as well, but we still need a doctrine that would explain those mitigators. One doctrine, because otherwise we don't know where to draw the line between those mitigators. For instance, the extreme mental or emotional disturbance has been severely criticized. And uh, quite recently, the uh, uh, Law Commission for uh, uh, England and Wales, when they decided how to revise their uh, mitigators, they looked closely at EMED and rejected it as being uh, too subjectivized and too ex excusatory and not, not uh, in uh, accord with the retributivist principles. So uh, I think we do need, we do need one uh, general doctrine, and in my opinion, this doctrine of malice, uh, as amorphous as I admit it may be, it has value, and it has value in exploring and developing it uh, for uh, the purposes of legislative drafting. I will stop here. I think I took too much time. Stephen, do you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, I'll start with Kim. Um, first of all, Kim is absolutely right, of course, that uh, harm itself has no moral balance. Uh, Yes, but we, we, we know that's a huge dispute. Turning to the topic of, however, of my paper, Kim is absolutely right that uh, Justice O'Connor got it right in Egelhoff that essentially the evidentiary rule that Justice Scalia adopted, and he had a choice. He could have said it was either an evidentiary rule or he could have said it was a substantive rule of liability. Uh, speaking for the plurality, he called it evidentiary and it did set up a conclusive presumption which leads to a very interesting point that was raised by Gideon yesterday and Kim reflected on it today. You know, we're always making inferences about what people's mental states are, even if they tell us we don't necessarily believe them. If you've ever bought a car, you know that. So the question then is, how do we ever get it right? And the question, and the, I think the answer is, we get it right lots of the time because we use ordinary folk psychological inferences to infer that other people are more like us than less like us, unless there's some counter story, as Gideon said. And we're very good mind readers. If we weren't good mind readers, we wouldn't at all be able to have successful human action. So it's just in the law, we're doing what we all do every single day, read each other's intention. As to uh, justice, um, Ginsburg's concurrence is very interesting. She, of course, made the Montana rule a substantive rule, a uh, liability rule as opposed to an evidentiary rule. And the reasoning was, I believe, although she wasn't clear, I think the reasoning was she understood as an evidentiary rule, it was flat out unfair, as Kim suggested, where she's willing to give Montana much more leeway on how it defines its crimes and defenses. Let me turn now to uh, Nancy's good remarks. Uh, Nancy, I think that in the guise of seeking an intermediate position, that's not really what you're doing. I mean, there's no intermediate position between the way the world is metaphysically and the way it isn't. When you talked about um, uh, cases like people with traumatic uh, stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or early childhood deprivation and the like, what I think you're really looking for is grounds for broadening partial excusing conditions, or perhaps even fully excusing conditions, which is absolutely fine with me. So then the interesting question becomes, what does neuroscience or genetics or anything else add to that? Well, we only get the scientific correlations with what we consider to be properly excusing conditions if we've identified what those proper excusing conditions are in the first place behaviorally the sciences piggyback entirely on our folk psychological model of the human being, as long as we retain that folk psychological model. So let's look at early childhood deprivation. How does this affect somebody's self-control characteristics? How does it affect their rationality characteristics? And it may be that neuroscience will finally have something to teach us about that, at which point I say, bring it on. The more good evidence, the more helpful science, the better. And I am not at all averse, as you know, to expanding excusing conditions to some degree, because I'm with those who believe that you can be an absolutely tender retributivist. I am one. So there we are. 
So wonderful with that. I think I'm going to go now to the questions in the chat box. It looks like the first question we had was from Josh Kleinfeld. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. Hi. I, you know, I just want to preface this by saying this is an amazing panel. Um, the, the folks on this panel, Nancy, Vera, Stephen, Kim, are, are some of those who I have learned the most from uh, in, my, in my reading, and I just want to express my admiration. My question is, it, it's really a supportive comment to Vera uh, uh, with a question mark at the end. Um, so I... I was initially persuaded by Bill Stuntz's critique of the MPC's purely cognitive um, uh, standards for mens rea and his defense of the common law. And, and uh, as I dug deeper, I became more and more convinced that he and now you are right about that. And I just want to tell you about a little unscientific experiment I do every year when I teach criminal law, because I think it supports your intuitions. Uh, on this. Uh, one of these days, I really want to partner with an empiricist to do this right. But here's my completely unscientific approach. Um, I take a, a bunch of cases, uh, uh, either cases of accidental but wrongful killing or um, uh, in uh, various kinds of uh, <coughs> intentional killing. And I give the, the students um, instructions uh, which I draw from pretty standard uh, uh, model jury instructions about what, what constitutes malice or what constitutes negligence. I use the moralized language of the common law, so I'll talk about things like denial of the value of human life or devaluation of human life, or indeed a wicked heart uh, or a depraved heart. And, uh, and then I give them uh, instructions drawn for the same crimes from, um, uh, from the MPC. And I've made two observations. Um, one is that uh, inter-observer agreement goes up with the common law standards. I believe we pretend that we don't know what moral language means because it's unfashionable to use moral, moralized language and in, in, indeed in modernity. Uh, but we all know exactly what it means. And it's really quite striking that when you tell someone, you know, Michael Jackson's doctor did such and such and thus and such. Does that count as um, gross negligence? Does it count as a conscious disregard of a known risk? They disagree with each other quite radically. You'll get two thirds, one third sort of split among the 60 to 80 students. But when you say, um, did he act with, um, uh, in such a way as to show indifference to the value of Michael Jackson's life or some equivalent standard drawn from the model jury instructions, inner observer agreement goes up. And I believe there's no meaning to the term clarity except inter observer agreement. And therefore the common law moralized standards are, if, if empirical studies could back this up more formally, are more clear than the psychologized standards of the MPC. And, I, and the second thing I observe is that uh, uh, students are more lenient. That is, they are more inclined to acquit when they use the moralized standards of the common law. Um, I think, again, I, I really need to partner with someone who knows how to do empirical studies, but I, I think it's kind of a gimme uh, for, for someone uh, of that ilk. And, and what it would show is that the common law standards lead to more justice. That's it. May I answer? Go ahead, yeah, please. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, Steph. This is fascinating, and uh, I would love to see if you have any results, uh, any evidence, paper, whatever you have on that, because it, it completely agrees with my intuition, and also, uh, with the polls, public polls that were done uh, by the uh, Law Commission of England and Wales very recently. I believe the person who did that, and the materials are in the appendix, is uh, Mitchell, don't remember his first name, and uh, the reactions to those uh, numerous situations were in terms of the MPC, they would be very similar because the actions were done, say, intentionally, purposely, knowingly, the reactions would be very different because of the moral component of what was done. So thank you very much for this comment. 
Okay, so why don't we, I believe that Ken Simons was next in the queue. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question, Ken? Uh, sure. And um, yeah, I also had a question for Vera. Uh, I have a lot of uh, sympathy for your general approach uh, and for some of your uh, concerns about the cognitive focus of the NPC. Um, but I also have some concerns about exactly how one would implement uh, a more malice uh, uh, focused approach. Um, uh, let me just, an initial thing I'll say is I've been teaching defamation law and torts for the, uh, an advanced torts class for the first time this semester. And there's a really interesting dual standard of malice in tort law. There's the actual malice standard under constitutional law which is basically NPC knowledge or recklessness. But then there's also a traditional common law malice standard that requires evil or highly culpable motive or ill will or hatred or improper reason. And that still is also used in certain parts of defamation law. So there, there's definitely precedent for this. But I, I, I guess I, I really worry about using the, uh, a notion of malice in the criminal law, uh, uh, or at least about how well one can define it. It's part of my concern in the willful blindness paper I'll be talking about later, but uh, one very concrete example of it, I think, is depraved heart murder. There's an exception the NPC itself recognized, but I've looked at a lot of depraved heart murder cases. They are a complete mess. The state of New York has struggled for decades and keeps going back and forth about what it means. Can you bring depraved heart as well as an intent to kill this case? Uh, some jurisdictions say depraved heart requires multiple victims, uh, a general indifference as opposed to indifference focused on one person. Uh, and I'm really concerned about whether we can come up with a standard that can be consistently applied by uh, fact finders uh, and it's not unduly vague, even though in principle, I agree that it reflects something beyond merely what degree of risk you believed you were imposing. The, the cognitive sense of recklessness is not enough. We need recklessness plus, but we also just need clear criteria. So I don't know if you have some thoughts about how to implement this in a more uh, a more fair and consistent way. Thank you, Ken. Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, for supporting this view in general, which is not surprising because I learned so much from your work while I was exploring this. Um, and uh, yes, uh, one thing that impressed me is that 48 states, in fact, have uh, 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 some statute, some definitions of malice in the torts law, 48 out of 50. And I think the other two uh, that don't, it's because they, I don't remember why, but some kind of respectable reason. Um, we certainly can distinguish between the two kinds of recklessness, right? Uh, one, when I'm reckless because I generally don't uh, quite care of uh, the possible consequences. And the other when the reason I'm doing that is because I want to be reckless. Is the, the, my whole purpose of doing that is to cause the kind of risk. So to give a couple of examples, one would be, you know, just plain reckless driving while, you know, talking on the phone and realizing that it is dangerous and getting an accident. Uh, it's plain recklessness because um, I know it is dangerous, it's, but I'm not doing it because it is dangerous. I'm doing it for other reasons. And another example, you know, when I say I down a bottle of vodka, blindfold fold myself and drive at high speed around an elementary school because I think it's a lot of fun. The very fun is creating this kind of risk and seeing what happens. So I think that intuitive uh, difference, the way we should try to, dra uh, to um, draft it. And I was also playing with possibility of specific intent, of uh, intent uh, with respect to attending circumstances, but we probably should focus more on the um, uh, 
specific reason for creating this risk, if we're talking about the uh, recklessness plus. And if we're talking about uh, regular intent, it's not just, again, cognitive, it's a specific uh, intent, specific desire, motive to cause harm. So giving example of that would be, uh, for instance, um, it, it's not quite intentional, but it will illustrate that, say, one thing, uh, having sex with someone uh, without due regard to whether this person consents or not, and totally differently having sex with this person specifically because that person does not consent. We understand the difference between the two. So I think that drafting, even though I'm not quite ready to provide the exact language, but I think those contours uh, we all intuitively capture. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Okay, I, I believe Doug Huzak, you're up next. Good. I hope I can be heard and seen. There we go. So this is a question for Stephen. And Stephen, I think, of course, you and I agree so much. And I'm 100% convinced that you're right, that it is a mistake to take any culpability involved in voluntarily becoming reckless and to use that to substitute for what would otherwise be a reckless act, uh, an act where you aren't conscious of a risk but would be conscious if you were sober. That is an equation that shouldn't be made. And it really is astounding how many people uh, continue to make that equation. And I think you're exactly right to resist it. My question is whether you're inclined to use comparable tracing contexts in uh, 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 tracing arguments in other contexts. For example, negligence, it's a familiar argument to say that the culpability of negligence is not uh, something that you can find at the time the person acts negligently, but you trace back to some previous act that the person should have done, that had he done, he wouldn't uh, have been ignorant of something that he is ignorant of. And so that's a way by taking a what synchronous look at the act, you can find culpability through a tracing strategy that you're uninclined to accept in the intoxication context. So I wonder whether you're comparably skeptical of tracing in, in virtually all contexts. Maybe you find a, a single case where it works. But generally, are you as skeptical of it as you are in the intoxication context? No, I am, I am generally skeptical. Uh, the way I think of negligence is somewhat differently. And although I've been uh, teaching this stuff for 45 years, and it makes me feel old to think that two distinguished members of this panel have been my students. Uh, so that is really upsetting. As Woody Allen said, 85% of success is showing up. Uh, I think of negligence as not tracing back, like in the Desina case, when he got behind the wheel. I think it is essentially at the time of the negligent conduct. You're basically, uh, negligence I think of as an omission. The failure to stop, look, and listen at the moment when you have a duty to stop, look, and listen. And the reason I'm inclined still to allow for negligence liability, although as you know, I'm very ambivalent about it, um, unlike Larry and Kim who want to get rid of it, I am still ambivalent. I keep it for now, is because when we're talking about criminal law uh, negligence, we're talking about enhanced levels of harm, really enhanced levels of harm, or else you don't get to criminal liability. You're stuck in tort. And under those levels of carelessness, as it were, everybody has a duty to stop, look, and listen. Whereas in intoxication cases, 99.9% .9 of cases of intoxication, you have no duty to stop, look, and listen. The one major example, or counterexample, excuse me, is if you're drinking at a bar and the only way there's no taxi service, no Uber, and the only way you can get home, if you're not gonna sleep on the floor of the tavern, is to drive drunk. And if you know you're gonna be driving drunk later in the evening, uh, then arguably there's some possible justification for liability, but not otherwise. So at this point, I want to ask Judge Gertner a question. Um, so when I was reading Vera's piece, 
uh, kind of reminded me of a piece of yours on federal sentencing and gender. And in that piece, you highlight a lot of ways in which the US federal sentencing guidelines um, can be particularly disproportionate as applied to women. And some of the th reasons seem to be things that Vera was highlighting in her paper. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk with us a little bit about that. You're, you're talking about the ways in which arguably neutral rule redounds to the detriment of women. Um, I, I think um, uh, the question will be, who will be considered, the, the, who, will, who will be in the bucket of malice? And that once something is as um, diffuse as that and explicitly normative, all sorts of other normative issues enter into it. Um, the parallel is not necessarily my piece on sentencing, but um, the law of provocation, for example, which is deeply, deeply gendered. And the question is whether the law of malice would likewise be gendered. And so to some degree, the MPC, by keeping the eye on a very narrow set of balls um, uh, in order to keep juries from uh, going off the rails was, was appropriate. Uh, so the question is whether well, malice will be more fluid and will make a difference, uh, you know, it, depending upon who the defendant is. Um, and I don't know whether that's something that you thought about. I mean, that's what happens when you get to normative, uh, when you get things that are much more explicitly normative. Mm -hmm. Vera, do you want to respond to that? You asked me? Yeah, would you like to respond to that? Uh, yes, and I completely agree. And the actually the MPC is probably uh, even more um, unfair to women as a result than the traditional rule of provocation, simply because it is so open-ended. But again, returning to the Law Commission, um, which materials I have been reading a lot lately, which I guess shows, uh, they rewrote the law of provocation to include uh, fear, and specifically they did that be, uh, because of the concern that uh, the way the law of provocation worked, it was uh, provided mitigation for rage, which is a very uh, masculine response, but instead it did not provide any kind of mitigation for, say, battered wives who did not act on impulse and did not, um, uh, if, if they killed killed. Killed, uh, killed out of rage, but out of fear of violence. So they provided the second ground for mitigation, which is fear. And they um, initially, the commission did not even ask for the loss of control standard. However, the eventual law of 2009, they included loss of control. But surely when we're thinking about those doctrines, we cannot just think in the abstract. We should envision the way they would um, impact all, all kinds of populations. So I agree with that. <laughs> before, we, before we wrap up, I'm gonna have a question that just got sent in from Professor Francis Shen at University of Minnesota, um, who I know is teaching this semester with Judge Gertner. Um, okay, so Fran Francis writes, these men's right determinations are difficult even for an individual, but complicating matters further these decisions are being made by groups. Can the panel comment on whether and how we should factor jury decision-making dynamics into mens rea reform? I'll leave that to the group. I'll take a stab at that. Um, I don't think I'm particularly expert at it, but what we know about group dynamics is a lot depends on the dynamic in the group to begin with. If you have, uh, in general, groups tend to move towards the mean, but if you have somebody who's really extreme, that shifts the dynamics a lot. Uh, I agree with Francis entirely that it's, it's, it can be difficult, but I, I actually, I like the jury system and I like juries. I wish we had more jury trials. 
So something we've been speaking about a lot is our shared morality. And there's been this assumption that morality should track, you know, people's culpability judgments. But something I think, Vera, you know, you yourself have highlighted in work is, right, I, I think you put it like this, if, um, if, pop, if public opinion was a guide to the law of rape, there'd be a mini skirt defense to rape, right? And so I guess, you know, with these final couple of minutes, I'd be interested to, to for, you know, to, for people to weigh in, because I get the sense that everyone here on this panel is sympathetic to the idea that in general, criminal law should track our, you know, community intuitions of justice, but what happens when they, you know, are, can be illiberal in, in that type of way? Can I say a couple of words? Yeah. Okay. Uh, certainly, we should uh, distinguish what is uh, the uh, public morality in the way, in the descriptive sense, and uh, also in the normative sense. And not everything that people believe in the law should automatically uh, shadow, clearly not. But uh, because we have some general principles that uh, society we believe that some general values that we share in the society. I believe that if the rules and laws are explained in terms of those general values, perhaps there would be much less confusion. So when we give jury instructions and we just uh, are not clear on how the law of provocation works, uh, then we come up with people who might give this miniscule defense. But if we did explain the law of provocation basically as partially, just partial justification, at least partial justification, uh, that uh, is based on people's autonomy, and that we win, may not reduce someone's rights uh, just because an individual does something that she has the right to do, like wear a minister, then I believe the jury would have a much better sense of what can be the legitimate ground and whatnot. So with that, I just want to give uh, Kim Frizan the opportunity to get the last word in. So, so I, from our earlier discussions, um, Michael, I think part of this is because I'm part of the Model Penal Code uh, Sexual Assault uh, Reform Project. And I, I guess I agree completely with Vera on that, not so much on earlier parts of this panel. Uh, but um, one thing that I think that's really important to say about what's going on with that project is that we can have a shared morality and it can still be extremely difficult uh, to draft a good criminal code. The problem is we're trying to draft an ideal code in a non-ideal world. And when, uh, you know, we, sexual assault is grossly under-criminalized, uh, and at the same time, the criminal law is full of overcriminalization, and it disproportionately impacts marginalized communities. To take women's sexual autonomy seriously is to potentially impact those communities disproportionately. To take the disproportionate impacts seriously is to potentially undermine uh, women's sexual autonomy. And uh, that just makes this uh, impossible. I tell that to Erin Murphy, one of the co-reporters, uh, every time I say your job is impossible, and I mean it because we have important values, moral values that we all share and that we just can't reconcile in the real world. Wonderful. So with that, I first want to just thank everyone on this panel. This it was just it was such a pleasure and an honor to get to, to share share this with, with, with you all. And so so thank you. Um, and with that, we're going to bring this panel to an end, take a 10 minute break, and then we'll be up for our uh, final panel of the day. Thank you. <laughs>